and I'll email you. Okay, thank you. No worries. To strictly define it, it's that all the events that occur from fertilization until an infant is born. Conceptus means developing offspring. We don't always call it baby. Sometimes we call it embryo, pre-embryo, blastocyst. So it goes by various names, but conceptus may refer to any one of those terms. The developing offspring it just depends when. Gestation is from the last menstrual period from birth. So when you had your less, when a woman had their last menstrual period, a period they weren't pregnant, but that that's the event we can use to time when uh, your due date is 40 weeks later. Okay, really, fertilization occurred. You assume two weeks after the last menstrual period. Preembryo, conceptus from fertilization, all the way to two weeks. So for the first two weeks of development after fertilization, we spend a lot of time on that. And also for embryonic development, week three through eight, we also spend a lot of time on that, focusing mostly on placental development. For fetal organization, we don't talk about that too much in this class. Most of the time is spent talking about pre-embryo, embryo parts. Right, well, here's a relative size of development when it's the fertilized egg on the left for a full 12-week week fetus on the right. So it's just a relative size comparison. You start off as a speck of sand. You develop into a, a full human. Now, 
to back it up before you were conceived, let's talk about all the structures that sperm must swim through to accomplish fertilization. And so when you practice, here's all the structures I think you should be able to name. The ejaculate would be here in the vaginal fornix. Sperm would have to swim through the external os, cervical canal, the internal os of the cervix, uterine cavity, and then through the uterine part of the uterine tube, isthmus of the uterine tube, and fertilization typically occurs around here, ampulla of the uterine tube. All right, so there are things that have to happen before fertilization, call it pre-fertilization, and then there's a lot of things that have to happen we call the events of fertilization. So, um, but you gotta find the oocyte. That's basically what free fertilization is. Now, ovulation is required, okay? That, that is typically day 14, so you got a day to fertilize. However, know that sperm is viable um, for about one to three days within the female reproductive tract. So fertilization to is, is to occur Maybe um, copulation ejaculation must occur no more than three days before ovulation or one day after. So that's a four day window. Although I'll say you have the best chance that day. Ovulation day is the best chance for fertilization and implantation. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the things that have, have to happen prior to fertilization. Pre fertilization events. Sperm capacitation. That's two words. Spread out. It's a softening of the sperm head. picture of the sperm head. Um, the goal here is you want to soften it because you want to spill lytic enzymes when you get close to the egg so you can penetrate these barriers surrounding the egg. One, two, spill lytic chemicals. close to oocyte. It's actually called the acrosomal reaction. <laughs> because let's remember what the acrosome is. I don't know if you remember if I drew in lecture uh, nuke, sperm nuke. <coughs> shaped sperm nuke and it had surrounded it with the, the acrosomal cap, the AC on this figure. I said that it was a double membrane structure with lytic chemicals on the inside. And that's surrounded by the plasma membrane. So the softening of the sperm head, it kind of increases the chances that you'll have the appropriate acrosomal reaction when you get to the egg. What we'll see is that when you, when you bind sperm receptacles, sperm receptors within zona pellucida, it'll trigger this reaction. And those proteins would have mentioned before is when sperm makes contact with ZP3. <coughs> that, that'll trigger this acrosomal reaction. All right, so I'll, I'll get to that. But anyways, this happens in the female reproductive tract. This is kind of like the last, one of the last maturation events of the sperm. And it doesn't even occur until you are in the female reproductive tract. So here are 
the barriers that you must penetrate to get to the egg. Okay. So notice you have the red corona radii zona pellucida. ovulated the oocyte, you ovulated some of those cells with it. Granulosa cells. So that's a barrier. you got to get through that. And then there's the zona pellucida. I'll put in parentheses ZP3. When you, when you contact that, ZP3, it may trigger an acrosomal reaction. But think of it as a barrier you must penetrate. It's a glycoprotein eggshell uh, barrier as well. Okay. Now the rest of the information here we've talked about to review, you should understand. This is showing you a sperm that has penetrated both barriers. All the other sperm you want to keep out. Now this can complete meiosis too. Half the genetic material will go to the genetic material provided by the sperm head. The other half will be ejected as the second polar body, there is the first. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, so I'll talk about the details of sperm penetration. That's this figure. We're still in the pre-fertilization category. Just call it sperm penetration. <clears throat> sperm penetration is not fertilization. It's still pre one approach. I call it penetration of uh, corona radiata. Sperm have surface enzymes that help penetrate between the granulosa cells. granulosa cells of corona radiata. That's what they're showing you there. So the first sperm that get there they're not the ones that fertilize. The first sperm that get there have to punch holes through these things. Maybe the second wave will have the fertilizing sperm. Well, in the next step, they call it acrosomal reaction. So a sperm contacted ZP3, it triggers a reaction. They give some details about calcium levels. Calcium is the second messenger that causes this, although I don't really care about calcium. Uh, you wouldn't even remember what acrosomal reaction is. Uh, okay, so acrosomal reaction. Sperm contacts ZP3. Uh, this is species specific. Okay, so human to human, uh, sperm to egg, uh, triggers acrosomal reaction. What's going to happen is you have that sperm head with the nuke inside, like I drew before. It has the double membrane, acrosomal cap, which is derived from, remember, that's a test question. I will look it up. Remember? Derived from Golgi. What is that now? This one. Oh, you want to know now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the acrosomal cap is derived from Golgi. Golgi apparatus. Propso, what? ZP3 is? 
Zona pellucida protein 3. It's one of the proteins in the ZP layer. So on this figure, the ZP layer, well, let's start from the outer. Th these cells are the granulosa cells. And what barrier do we call that? Corona radiata. This eggshell is the ZP3. And these little granules, okay, this layer is Zona pellucida, but the little granules are ZP3. Okay, they don't call them that because there's actually ZP1 through 4. I'll just stick to ZP3 because that's the one that does this. So what happens in the acrosomal reaction is this acrosomal cap derived from Golgi, there's a fusion between the plasma membrane and the outer membrane of the acrosomal cap. So let me be able to look something like this. that will allow all the lighted chemicals to spill onto the zona pellucida to help um, well, clear a path through. Okay, and that's what's being shown there. So that's step, they're what they call step two. And so when you clear the path, the fertilizing sperm can get in. Step three, they call binding. sperm's membrane to the oocyte's sperm binding receptors. <coughs> sperm membrane binds to oocytes sperm binding receptors. that allows for fusion, step four. Fusion of sperm oocyte cell membranes. <coughs> so that fusion allows for the contents to enter. So it says sperm contents enter this OO site. You can see it illustrated next. They contribute, well, the, the main thing that they contribute that you need to know, sperm nuke. Sperm nucleus enters OO site. So this is fertilization. Sperm got in. So in the last step of pre-fertilization block all the other sperm out because if more than one gets in and you have the incorrect amount of genetic material you won't get past fertilization okay. so we, this isn't even considered fertilization yet you let one in block the rest out then you start talking about fertilization so one got in step five block the polyspermy keep all the other ones out block to polyspermy. Um, once the sperm gets in, again, there's an increase in calcium levels. That triggers the exocytosis of these cortical granules, granules in the cortex region of the <coughs> oocyte. Once they s spill their contents onto the uh, outer zona pellucida, it'll harden it. And it'll clip off any any additional sperm binding receptors. And that'll keep others from getting in. So trigger a cortical 
reaction. The cortical reaction hardens zonopalusa and it clips off other sperm receptors. So that's the block from letting another sperm in. That should do it. If you get one cell, one sperm in, keep the rest out, um, you can proceed. So it's all pre-fertilization. Now, here's a picture of, of sperm penetration. But this sperm right here only got through corona radiata, these granulosa cells there. What would you call number two? Zona pellucida. Very good. Three is just like the uh, oocyte. Four is like the nucleus of the oocyte. So we do have models that show that. Here are the events of fertilization now that we've let the sperm in and kept all the other ones out. Always take inventory of things that you see and what's presented to you. So we've accomplished the penetration part, now fertilization. I still see corona radiata. I still see zona pellucida. But now you can finish meiosis too. phase of meiosis and a phase two. If you had to identify that, we already know it's the, the first polar body and well it's kind of stuck inside the zona pellucida. But now that sperm is there, now you can complete it. You can eject the second polar body. And then the next step is here. So I, I put these um, side by side to compare. Not everything's exactly the same. Kind of drives students crazy, but um, let's see if we can figure out the subtle differences. <coughs> On our picture, there's the sperm head that got in. On this model, is that fertilizing sperm? Yes or no? Well, it isn't. It's knocking on the door. That one got in. There's the tail of the one that got in. So those chromosomes belong to the sperm. Those are the chromosomes of the ovum from the egg. This one, here's what I asked, true, false. The sperm has contacted the oocyte cell membrane. True. That's the oocyte membrane, that's the pellucida. There's the ovum. Okay, they show the chromosomes and these little black dots there. Let's move on. Here I see um, zona pellucida, I see corona radiata starting to dissolve away. But now we have a swelling of the... Um, what I call what they call the pronuclei from the sperm and from the egg, male, female. So I guess this, this is one, this is two, four pronuclei. Pro means before, so this is before the nucleus of the first zygote, but we haven't gotten there yet. Right now the you just get sperm and ovum pronuclei. I call this N plus N because you have two sets of chromosomes that haven't intermixed yet, but they're in one cell. So I call it N plus N. You won't see that in the book, but I think you should know it is that. Uh, N represents 23 single chromosomes. The other N is 23 single chromosomes from sperm and from egg because they haven't fused together yet, but they will approach each other call it N plus N. It's not a zygote yet. I still see corona radiata. I still see zona pellucida. Let's move on. This model 
they illustrate it a little bit differently. They show you the first polar body, which is divided. That's why you have four dots instead of two. They show you this. I believe those two red dots are supposed to be the male chromosomes. Okay. So they show it a little bit differently. There's the female chromosomes there. So half of this will join that. So it's a little different on this model. Okay, the next step, step three, these pronuclei, they swell and they um, approach each other. It's still M plus N. They haven't fused together yet. But you also see a mitotic spindle forming that will help in cell division. <clears throat> There's no corona radiata, but do you see zona pellucida? Yes. It's still there. Okay, so this is still fertilization. It's still day 14 of the ovarian cycle, the day you ovulated, probably the day you fertilized. And you still see the polar bodies. There's the second one, and those two are from the first, stuck inside zona pellucida. Okay, so we have a lot of models. Well, this, these two models kind of show it. This model, um, we're going to go with that's the male chromosomes. Now, usually pink is for the female gender, but look how they colored the sperm nuclei there. Uh, I, I think they're trying to carry the colors over to the models that follow. Male, female, pronuclei. This one comes later. The chromosomes are condensing. So that's why I know this one comes after that one. You see the polar bodies up there? That's the second one, and those two are from the first polar body. Aha, uh -huh. so number four, this is conception. This is the event. Zygote formation. Pronuclei fuse. When the pronuclei fuse, the chromosomes intermix. And you've fully restored the genetic material. Um, so we're back to regular diploid. Okay. No longer the M plus N stuff. This, this was the goal. Okay. And at this point, you're done with fertilization once you get zygote formation. And you can start to talk about development past fertilization. Here's a picture of it. You can see the male and female pronuclei fusing. The chromosomes are intermixing. On our model, um, they don't show what's happening on the inside. They just kind of show it as, well, this is, this is one cell stage. Not much to look at, but it's, we all started this way. It's one cell. Okay. Is zona pellucida still there? Yes. And um, in terms of the anatomy, where does fertilization take place? Ampulla of the uterine tube. For the first few days post-fertilization, you remain there by design. Because remember, this is day 14, but you want to wait till around 21-ish <coughs> before you allow implantation. Because you want to allow time for the secretory phase to be in full swing. Okay. Alright, so zygote formation, that's the act of fertilization there. Now you can kind of start developing past fertilization. So now done with fertilization, it's called development. And you start talking days post fertilization. <coughs> but um, let's just call this day one uh, post fertilization. You're just one cell. <coughs> Still there. I won't keep writing it. I just want you 
to observe it's still there, because at some point it's going to go away. Now, in these first couple of few days, the cell divisions of mitosis, the, the, the daughter cells have to reduce in size because they're confined by the restricted space inside zona pellucida. So you got a zona pellucida, you're just one cell. If you're to become two cells, you have to just reduce in size. If you were to become four cells, just reduce it, reduce again. Two cells become four. So you go from one to two to four cell stage of development. Um, now we're a couple days post fertilization. Day two. So the days refer to post fertilization. Fertilization occurred on day 14 of the ovarian cycle. Okay. Get the third day, um, that's called the moila stage of development. I'm not going to try to draw that. Do you still see zona pellucida? Yes, it's still there. You're still in the oviduct, the uterine tube. It's basically a 16 cell stage. It's just a ball of cells. Morula means little mulberry. Solid ball of cells. Day four, early blastocyst. That's finally when the zona pellucida starts to degenerate. It starts to get close to the uterine cavity where it's exposed to lighting chemicals that will start to hatch it. starts to generate. Zona pellucida degenerates. Notice now that the solid ball of cells, um, it, it kind of like creates a little cavity on the inside. And so what you call these outer cells of the blastocyst, are called trophoblast cells. They actually will become the placenta. Okay, that's one detail. Now the inner mass cells, these cells on the inside, those actually will become the embryo. So that's baby. Now the trophoblast cells technically are the baby, but they'll definitely help the baby. So throughout this lecture, anytime I use the term extra embryonic, is to refer to any kind of cell tissue membrane that aren't the baby, but will help develop it. Okay. Now, so in this mass, the inner mass cells, Those are embryonic. Those are the baby. So that's what you see inside the early blastocyst. This is about the time it can enter the uterine cavity. Um, well, there it is, day seven. They call it implanting blastocyst. No ZP. Finally gone. Okay, degenerated. And you just got your inner mass cells and your trophoblast cells. So they call that seven days when it implants. Um, Let's show, let's show this, this slide here so you can kind of get a better view. So we talked about this morning, pre-fertilization events. Sperm had to swim all the way to the ampulla 
to accomplish fertilization. We talked about all the events of fertilization. Now we're talking about day one, two, three. Around day four, you, you're allowed entry into the uterine cavity. Okay, that's when you're exposed to fluids inside the uterine cavity that kind of degenerate. And now you're basically, let's say day five, you're free-floating blastocysts. Day five, free floating blastocysts. You've hatched, you're just free floating in the uterine cavity. But what, what's got to happen for you to implant is you got to stick to the wall. So the implantation of the blastocyst shown on day six is adhesion of the blastocyst. Six days post fertilization, shown there. Implantation. It starts to happen on day six because you have adhesion of blastocyst on endometrium. If you cut it inside, what happens is there's a free, it depends how you stick, but no matter how you stick to the wall, there's a free rotation of the inner mast cells so that they face the endometrial wall. Free rotation of inner mast cells to face. endometrium. So right now, you, adhesion means you just stick. Okay. Here is a, a day later, no, two days later, day eight. So maybe this, I mean, I'm not too strict about the days, so maybe this adhesion free rotation, maybe that's day six and seven. Um, just to keep the days uniform. I know you like that. Here's day eight. I'm not going to do every day, though. We'll be skipping around a lot. But day eight is called invasion. Consider implantation as having two phases. One is adhesion. The other is invasion. Day eight. Invasion of what? Of the blastocyst. It's digging a hole. It's literally digesting its way into the endometrial wall. Blastocyst. <laughs> digests its way into endometrial wall. And you just dig yourself all the way in. Here it shows it partially dug in. Now the structure that accomplishes this digestion of the endometrial wall, what you have to note is that the trophoblast differentiates into two parts, the syncytio and the cytotrophoblast. Trophoblast, that word literally means nourishment generator. It will become the placenta. The trophoblast differentiates into two parts, cytotrophoblast <coughs> Cyto means cell. This layer of trophoblast cells just maintain their cell integrity. They maintain a cellular boundary all the way around. It's the pink cells maintaining a cellular boundary. It's not doing the digestion part, though. Its job is just to maintain cellular boundary. 
The yellowish part is the syncytiotrophoblast. That's doing the digestion. What happens is, well, what you should know is that a syncytium, that word root, it means fused tissue. Fused tissue. That means the cells don't maintain their boundary. They break down they, and they create this giant blob, mass of cytoplasm, as illustrated. So if you look, the inner cells of the syncytial trophoblast, the, you can see the cellular boundaries beginning to decay. So the leading edge is just a giant blob that's eating its way in. So if you're in this area of the syncytial trophoblast, you detect large amounts of tumor necrosis factor alpha. I mean, it's just TNF alpha. For students, I write it out, but it's just TNF alpha. Other things like cadherin, sticky molecules. Because you're not just digging a hole. You have to dig a hole and then grab onto it. Right? So dig, grab, dig, or otherwise you just dig a hole and fall out. Right? You don't want to do that. Uh, so a lot of cadherins, you see HCG. Now HCG are largely want you to know for its gonadotropin function to maintain corpus luteum. But it may have some digestive adhesive qualities too. You see that in the area. So you're already supposed to know that the syncytiotrophoblast secretes HCG. You know, if you've forgotten that, just renote it. Okay, so that, that's kind of like accomplishing our, our digestion. And look at the other new things. Look at our inner massive cell. It has, it has, they have organized into two layers called the bilaminar embryonic disc. So this day continued over here. Day A continued. Their mass cells organize into a bilaminar embryonic disc. Bilaminar means how many layers? Two. Bilaminar means two layers. Very good. Yeah, two layers. And you can see them there, the blue and the yellow. That's epiblast, hypoblast of that disc. The epiblast is also known as superficial layer of cells. Superficial layer. And the hypoblast also known as just the deep layer. You see other things forming. That little bubble called the amnionic cavity, that starts to form. You see the start of the amnion. Now they list amnion and amnionic cavity as two different things. It's the same thing. Don't let it confuse you. I mean, cavity. Amniotic is an adjective. It describes something. Cavity. Okay? So it's the bubble part. But the cells that form the bubble, which are from the epiblast, you just call the amnion, the cells around the bubble. All right, let's move on from this. Um, now, where we're going with this is um, you want to dig deep enough to nick a maternal artery because that'll supply the blood for nourishment. Okay. And if you don't, you'll never make it. You'll just get sloughed off with the next menses. So let's think about this. This is day eight post fertilization. Okay, what date of fertilization occur on in the ovarian cycle? Fourteen. What's fourteen plus eight? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Right in the middle of secretory phase. So you're not missing menses yet, right? Uh, Oh, so here's a model we have in the room. This model, it's right over there. It's, um, you 
uterine germ when entering the mucus coat of uterus seven days in the beginning of implantation. Okay? Human germ. Okay. We usually use germs in a different context, but yeah, that's what's happening. I always ask these identify. This is that. What is this? Syncytio trophoblasts. Yeah. So practice spelling syncytio trophoblasts. That always makes it on some test. I see superficial deep layer of cells or epihypoblast. There's the cytotrophoblast going around there. There's the cytotrophoblast going around there. So I'm just trying to show you that when you study pictures in the book, the models are the same thing. It's not something different. Okay. Okay, here is day later. No, yeah, one day later, day nine. We're all in, right? We're all the way in. Fertilization. I'll just try to add on what's new here as we proceed. Now we see the syncytium trophoblast. It's all the way, all this yellowish illustration, they go all the way around there, the syncytium trophoblast. What's the pink layer? Yeah, that's the cytotrophoblast going around. Both of those trophoblasts extra embryonic. But the new thing to add here is you start to see how the syncytium trophoblast you start to form these lacuna. A lacuna is a space. So that's new. Let's see, <coughs> lacuna. Lacuna, singular, added E, pluralizes it. These are just spaces. Form within syncytio trophoblasts. To make a blood vessel, and you want these spaces to become filled with maternal blood, although that hasn't quite happened yet. We see um, our bilaminar embryonic disc. We see yolk sac. Yolk sac, extra embryonic. Okay. but it develops from cells that came from hypoblast, which is part of the embryonic disc. Derived from hypoblast cells. So what we noted prior is that the amion is, uh, well, maybe I didn't note it. I'll just say, just to put as a note. Amnion derived from epiblast cells. So at this point, around day nine ish, we're all in. Um, you can see that your, your, your little speck, little bump, a little cyst, if you will, right? They call it blastocyst for a reason. Right there. And you can start to define what are called the three deciduous. Now the decidua is basically the endometrium of pregnancy. And they use that word, well there's physical changes that occur uh, when you're pregnant in the endometrium. Well, it's like when you decide something. You make a decision. You go with one thing and the other thing falls away. Like deciduous leaves. Leaves that fall off. So the decidua means that which falls off. Because after you give birth, what comes next? Well, the placenta, right? Which is endometrium, which is decidua. So um, the three decidua is shown here. <coughs> OK. Uh, 
atrium of pregnancy. So the three deciduas, you have decidua capsularis, That is the, um, well, it's the endometrium, it's the decidua that overlies the embryo. Okay. Overlies the embryo. The decidual basalis underlies embryo. Now the rest of it the rest of the decidua, decidua paratalis, it lines the rest of the uterine cavity. Okay, decidua paratalis. Lines rest of uterine cavity. Proceed. Um, okay, to day twelve. Day twelve. We still have our, what I call the two balloons. We have the yolk sac and the amnion, our two balloons. We have a bilaminar embryonic disc. We still have our cytotrophoblastus and cystotrophoblastus. But it looks like we did it. We, we've nicked the maternal sinusoid, that's a blood vessel. So at this stage is probably one of the first days where the lacuna will become filled with maternal blood as well as secretions from the uh, uterine glands. Okay. Tuna become filled with maternal blood and glycogen from urine glands. The other thing I see that's starting to form is a proliferating extra embryonic mesoderm. Those little cells are starting to multiply. <coughs> All that extra embryonic mesoderm. See, extra embryonic mesoderm. Okay, that'll become more important later too in terms of the uh, placenta. So, um, this kind of gets to the next important phase, gastrulation. This is where the bilaminar disc will become a trilaminar disc. And that trilaminar disc will become these three primary germ layers. So right around the day 14, this, this will occur around day 14, 16-ish, right around there.
gastrulation, which is what the main thing I'll focus on is bilaminar disc, it becomes a trilaminar disc. And those, well, those three layers are noted here, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. So maybe, now that's the embryo. Instead of two layers, it's three layers of cells. They will form all the organ systems in the body. I kind of gave you a prelude there. I'm not going to hold you responsible for that. You could look it up, but just suffice it to say, all your organ systems come from three germ layers, all of them. So just to kind of back it up and then go forward, here's day 14 and 15 after fertilization. We're still bilaminar, but at, at around this time, it's going to be trilaminar. So what happens at around day 14, 15. You got a bilaminar disc. What they do is they remove the two balloons. They cut the balloons off. You got the head. There's the head end of the bilaminar disc. You, you cut right there where the vertebral column would be. That's the primitive streak, which will become the vertebral column. And what happens is you have these two migration events. The first one occurs <coughs> at day 14, 15 of gastrulation. this first migration of epiblast cells into the primitive streak. What the picture is showing you is when, when those cells dive in to the primitive streak, they replace the underlying cells and they become the ectoderm. That's called the endoderm. Let me write that down. These cells become the endoderm. That's one of our layers. Here, right? The next day, call it day 16, you have a second migration. It's the same thing. Second migration of epiblast cells into primitive streak. Now, what happens is those invading cells, they get sandwiched between cells top and bottom. They become the mesoderm. And the cells that did not migrate, you just call the ectoderm. These cells become mesoderm. The remaining epiblast cells become the ectoderm. Okay, this is a good spot for a break. Uh, come back in 20 minutes, about 12:20.